me to speak. Um, my name is Peter. I'm one of the incoming interns. I've also been here for the past four years. So uh, hopefully I have learned something that I could share with you guys. Um, and then uh, we'll kind of take this on a basic level and then just kind of as a head start. And if you guys appreciate a talk like this, I, I think we could get a series going and kind of increase the complexity and start to learn more things together. But um, we'll see how this one goes and then uh, we'll take it from there. Um, and then anyone, okay, actually we'll just start. Uh, actually before, how many of you guys are M1s? Oh, oh, oh uh, everyone's, okay. And Zoom, I'm guessing all M1s, okay. So we'll, we'll kind of tailor this to be a very basic talk since I'm sure you guys, did you do uh, MSK Anatomy yet? Oh, you did, okay. Cause I know they moved that at some point. And, uh, but you guys probably haven't seen that much ortho yet, right? Yeah. No, okay. So we'll keep this basic. If anything's too complicated, just stop me and then we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. So we're gonna be talking about some common forearm fractures. Um, so just to briefly review some of the epidemiology, uh, these tend to be pretty common in children. Um, children are always running around and you know playing, falling, things like that. And uh, a lot of times they're stopping their falls and breaking their falls with their hands, uh, which is a common mechanism of injury. Um, it's also commonly associated with um, certain sports injuries or MVCs, things like that. Um, they can be... Uh, also, they can also occur in older women uh, who may have osteoporosis, but again, it's just uncommon. Uh, they tend to have uh, some more common fractures from falls like hip fractures and things of that nature. But before we start talking about that, it would be a good for us to kind of like review um, some of the anatomy that you guys learned earlier this year. So as you guys know, uh, your forearm, there's two main bones, the radius and the ulna, and the, they are... Um, kind of, they articulate with the humerus at the trochlear groove and the trochlear surface, um, and that's your elbow joint. If you kind of look on the right picture, you'll see some more of the osteology of the radius and the ulna. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, mid-shaft fractures. Uh, as you guys know, the shaft is kind of like the long part of the bone, um, and then uh, the metaphysis is where it begins to widen. And then the epiphysis is all the way at the end. And one common thing that, that you guys should know about, especially we'll be talking about some pediatric fractures today, is the physis or the growth plate that occurs at the ends of the bone. And we'll kind of see that in some of the imaging. Um, some other parts that I'll, I'll just kind of mention, um, if you see the head of the radius there proximally, um, that's going to come up in one of our fractures. Um, and then also on the in the ulna, you could see the coracoid process. And then both distally in, in both the radius and the ulna, you'll have a styloid process. Okay. So just reviewing some of the nerves and the vasculature. Um, so uh, the brachial vein and the cephalic vein are your two venous structures within the forearm. And then uh, in terms of the arteries, you have the radial artery and the ulnar artery. Does anyone know where they stem from? What, what's their common origin? The brachial artery, right? And, and that's going to split mostly at the forearm. Uh, I'm sorry, at the elbow, kind of uh, at the neck of the radius, as you could kind of see in that picture. And then um, some of the nerves that we talk about when we look at the forearm and then more uh, distally, are the ulnar nerves, the median nerves, and the radial nerves. And uh, I'm sure you guys have learned this by now, but those originate, kind of come off from the brachial plexus, uh, C5 to T1, and those are the origins, and they kind of innervate uh, the upper extremity. And we'll get into more of uh, some of the innervations and kind of how to check nerve function uh, as we move on. So, uh, you get a call from the ED and the console. They're saying someone's, you know, broke something in their forearm. They want you to come look at it. These are some of the common things that you're going to see uh, when you first walk in the room. Uh, patients, you're going to say, hey, what's going on? Um, they're going to tell you, oh, I, you know, I had a fall or I ran into something and then I tripped and fell on and stopped to uh, try to stop my fall by stretching out my hand. And now something really hurts in my forearm. You're going to look at their forearm 
and you're going to maybe see some swelling or um, ecchymosis. They might not be able to move their extremity all the way. So you're going to look at their range of motion and then they might complain of um, some numbness tingling or if, you know, if there's any nerve injury, um, severe nerve injury, maybe they're not able to move a certain way. So um, that Peter, sorry to interrupt. Um, the, the Zoomers can't see your screen. So if you guys could just click share screen real quick. So. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. All good now. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you're going to walk into the room. Um, and then this is kind of what the patients are going to be telling you. And these are going to be the things that you notice kind of off the bat without talking to even talking to the patient yet. Right. Um, how they're holding their arm, uh, if, if they're able to move it or not while talking to you and what they're complaining of. Uh, so you get the story and now you're going to start to say, okay, well, I want to see what's going on. I'm going to, I have to go report this to my attending. What are the key pieces of information that they're going to ask me about that I need to tell them right away? Number one thing um, that you should always look for in any sort of fracture, not just a forearm fracture, um, is whether the fracture is open or not. Who knows what that means? Okay. Yeah. Did it break the skin or not? So if as you guys know, um, open fractures are a little bit more urgent um, because you can't, you know, obviously can't leave it open and there's high risks of infection. And the things that you're going to do right away um, is, you know, one of the most common, uh, commonly asked questions is, you know, what are the predictors of, um, you know, success following an open fracture or how do you treat patients? What's the most common thing to prevent mortality and things of that nature? And that's going to be time to antibiotics. Number one in the literature, always you want to give antibiotics within the first hour that you see an open fracture. Um, you get a call from the ED and they say, you know, I, I have an open distal radius fracture. Before you even leave, you know, the call room to go see the consult, your first question to the ED should be, do you give antibiotics? If they said yes, then, you know, you're good to go. Another thing that we're going to do is give tetanus if the patient uh, hasn't gotten their tetanus booster um, within, you know, the past 10 years or if they're a kid, uh, a little bit different. But you you always want to ask those two for any open fractures. Um, next couple things that you're going to do is you're going to assess uh, range of motion. Uh, so you want to see if the, the patient, you know, depending on where the fracture is, uh, you want to check a good rule of thumb is that you want to check the joint before proximal and the joint uh, distal to wherever the fracture is. Um, sometimes, you know, the ED will say, or they'll, you'll see a patient with a forearm fracture and they'll get a nice x-ray of the forearm hand, but maybe they miss the elbow. And then you're assessing the patient, you notice some tenderness or, you know, some deformity, and then you go back and you get an x-ray of the elbow and uh, th there's maybe a dislocation or another fracture or anything like that. So anytime you look at a fracture in general, the rule of thumb is look at the joint below and the joint, uh, the joint proximal and the joint distal. Um, so you're assessing range of motion. You're going to start to palpate um, along everywhere, again, from both joints and in between, um, anywhere that they have tenderness. And the part that they're going to have most tenderness is in, in is probably where the fracture uh, is. Um, and then you're also going to see if there's any gross malalignment of the limbs. So, you know, if patient comes in and their, you know, their forearms kind of like dangling off, then, then you'll see there's obviously a fracture. You don't need an x-ray to get that. Um, and, and you'll probably know that it's both bones if, you know, if there's no stability at all. Um, you could also see if it's uh, of the fractures, you know, uh, pointing volar or dorsal in one way or another. Um, so some common things that you, you'll be able to see if there's gross uh, malalignment. If not, it's, it's not always the case. Sometimes fractures are subtle, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but you'll see that there, they, you know, there's something going on because they're going to be complaining of pain. Um, so imaging, we'll, we'll talk about imaging in a little bit. Uh, hopefully before you've, you know, you've gone to see the console, the ED has done some imaging and you're able to see what's going on. 
But regardless, let's say they didn't, um, they just kind of called you right away and you got there. You're going to, again, want to assess, you know, what imaging do I need? Uh, if, if you're thinking it's a forearm fracture, do you want just a forearm? Probably not. You want to extend, again, joint below and joint above. Um, and then you're going to start doing your more aspects of your physical exam because, again, you're going to go and report this to your attending and they're going to want to say, um, you know, is there any nerve damage? Is there anything that is beyond, um, you know, anything that might make me, make me more inclined to come and treat this either a operatively or urgently um, versus non-operative treatment? You know, can I send this patient out and, and see them in clinic or are, is there anything more severe going on that I should be worried about? Okay. So um, neurovascular status, um, some of the things you're going to look for are the nerve status. Um, so we talked about the radial, median, and ulnar nerves in the forearm and the hand. Uh, so what's a good way to check for radial nerve motor function? Yo, extension. Okay, so you could extend the wrist. If you're looking at the hand, um, you you always want to check the wrist because um, obviously that that's also extension here is radial nerve. But you also want to check more distally because sometimes if you have you know distal, the nerve is cut, you know, or severed, or lesion is more distal, you might only get um, you know uh, a deformity or or something within the hand itself. So one way to test the nerve is that you always want to check not only at the proximal innervation, but the distal innervation. Um, and if you guys ever see in clinic or you see any patients, you know, in the ED, if there's anything related to the hand or the forearm, there's kind of three things that the residents will do just to kind of quickly assess uh, nerve vascular status or sorry, nerve function, specifically radial nerve, median nerve, and ulnar nerve uh, when we're talking about motor function. Radial nerve, you're going to ask them to give you a thumbs up, right? So if they're extending their thumb to give you a thumbs up. That's your EPL, um, and that's uh, innervated by the radial nerve, okay? So then median nerve, how am I going to check median nerve? Again, we're thinking distally within the hand, right? So opposition, yeah, exactly, the okay sign, right? So the okay sign, um, here I'm testing two things. So I'm, I'm looking at flexion at the IP joint of the thumb, and then I'm also looking at flexion of the PIP within the index finger. So if someone's able to give me the okay sign, that means they're able to flex at both digits. Um, I know median nerve is intact, okay? Ulnar nerve, how do I check ulnar nerve? Right, abduction, adduction. So the, a good way to check that is if I ask my patient to cross their finger, their index and middle fingers like this, right? And then spread them apart and then cross. That's a good way to check for ulnar nerve function, because what does the ulnar nerve innervate within the hand? What are some of the intrinsic hand muscles? Right, okay, so the interossei is what we're checking here, and there's dorsal and volar or uh, palmar interossei. Uh, which one are we checking, you know, when we're abducting? Abducting. Oh, ab yeah. ab okay. ab abducting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dorsal is abducting, and then palmar is ab. Right. Okay. So you guys got that. Awesome. Um. So I checked. Uh, I checked. Um. My motor function. Am I done with my nerve exam? No. What do I have to do? Fancy. Exactly. And you guys, I'm sure you've seen. You know the diagrams of where the the various nerves innervate um the radial nerve you're going to want to check you know mostly in the back ulnar nerve is your last two di digits and then your um median nerve anywhere you know within the palm the thumb uh one two three first or three and a half depending on which you know resource you're looking at okay this may be a dumb question but like are you just like tapping for sensation or... um you, you could ask the patient you know if you have something like a little maybe like a key or something a little bit sharp you could just check um but in general uh you're asking them you could just move your finger along and say do you feel me touching here do you feel me touching here you always what's the rule of thumb in orthopedics whenever you're checking you know nerve function range of motion anything like that what do you always have to do 
that's I mean that's that's good not always necessary but the, but where I was going is that you always want to check um the contralateral hit right or, or extremity or whatever it is that you're testing for some reason maybe this patient's not feeling it on both arms then maybe you know it's you know something you know possibly not new but in general, you want to always assess both limbs. If you're checking, you know, the hand on the right, then you want to check the hand on the left and compare. And uh, that way you'll see if, if this patient is, you know, maybe just not feeling overall, maybe they're anxious, maybe they're not reporting or answering the question right. If the findings are similar between the injured arm and the non-injured arm, or if they're able to, you know, pronounce one injury more on, in one extremity, then, you know, there, there might be something there. Okay. Um, so now we've checked, um, the nerve vascular status. Okay. So next, or actually we checked the nerve status. What's the other part of that? Vascular. Vasculature, right? So you're, you're going to check pulses. Um, and that's self-explanatory radial ulnar pulses. And you heard also you sometimes, sometimes, um, you're going to want to see, you know, if there's a severe vascular injury, where the patient's not getting perfusion distally, what could you notice immediately right away? Okay, exactly. Color change within any of like any part of the extremity is something that you would want to make note of. And again, that's something that your attending will want to know when you're reporting this, you know, uh, consult or whatever. Um, the last thing is uh, ruling out compartment syndrome. Okay, compartment syndrome. We'll, we'll kind of talk about it later. But sometimes if you have, you know, a severe injury um, and there's, you know, whether it's for any reason, you're going to always get soft tissue swelling, obviously, because things move, there's going to be bleeding in the area. Uh, sometimes if there's bleeding within a specific compartment or tissue swelling within one specific compartment of the arm or the hand, um, you're going to see a lot of uh, swelling. And uh, there are some cardinal signs for compartment syndrome. What do you guys know about compartment syndrome. So five keys or six pulses. Okay. So pulselessness. Pain. Pain out of proportion to the injury. So if it's a simple fracture, but then you go and like maybe you haven't even, you know, pressed on the fracture and you just touch their skin and they push you out of the way and scream, then then you know something is wrong. Like a fracture hurts. Nobody's denying that, but they shouldn't be that uncomfortable, right? Okay. So we said pulselessness, pain out of proportion. Paresthesia. Paresthesias, numbness, tingling. Um, what else? Okay. And then uh, so sometimes you'll see uh, pain with passive extension or passive range of motion. Sometimes not directly on palpation or whatever, but if you start passively moving the extremity and there it's severe pain, um, again, a good, a good indication. Okay. So in the forearm, when we're specifically looking here, which is what we'll be talking about today, um, there's three compartments within the forearm. Does anyone know what they are? Two of them are kind of basic, if you could guess. Yeah, so volar and dorsal, and then there's also oh. lateral mobile wad. Okay, so volar, what? dorsal, lateral mobile wad. That's what it's called. Wad, W-A-D, okay? So those are the three compartments, if anyone ever asks you. Within the hand, it's more complicated. There's actually 10 different compartments. There's four dorsal, three volar, and then the adductor pollicis compartment. And then you have the thenar and the hypothenar mm -hmm. compartments. Okay? So thenar, hypothenar, the adductor pollicis, and then um, four uh, dorsal and three volar. Okay. Any questions? All right, so now we'll, we'll start talking about some of these fractures um, and we'll, we'll kind of take this again at a very basic level. And if you guys have any questions, uh, we, we could talk about it more. Uh, but the purpose here for today is to just kind of understand, um, A, the train of thought. Like I get, you know, if you're a student on a rotation, ortho rotation, and, you know, the resident asks you to go see this council and I'll be right there. You know, you walk in the room, what are the things that you're going to be assessing? Um, what are the things that you're going to be looking out for? Um, and then two, learning the basics of describing imaging. You know, if they pull up an x-ray and they tell you, talk me through what's going on here. You know, having kind of like a framework to do that, I, I think is adequate at your level. 
Um, obviously, learning management and treatment, that's a little bit further down the line. But at your level, actually, all of you as M1s, just the anatomy is good enough. Um, but this is to kind of help you get to that third, fourth year level um, so that uh, you guys can be prepared for your rotations and like sub eyes later on. OK. So one of the most common fractures, if you guys have been, at, um, you know, shadowing or seen any of the consults with the residents or if you've attended fracture conference is a pediatric both bone fracture okay so uh it counts for 40 percent of all pediatric fractures not even just in the upper extremity i mean sorry upper extremity but all fractures in peds uh tends to be more common in males than females um and then the patient who comes in with a pediatric both bone fracture will tell you you know forearm pain they're going to be if, if you walk in a room kids you know if they're going to be crying they're going to be whatever the first thing you're going to notice if there's a legitimate fracture is that they're going to be talking to you and moving around and whatever and using let's say it's my right arm that's you know fractured i'm going to be talking to you and describing things with my left arm because they're they're in so much pain and their primary defense mechanism is to say i'm not just, just going to completely not use this arm at all okay so then um, you're going to look at them and then you're going to obviously do some of the exam that we talked about. Um, you're going to assess for any pain. Uh, you're going to look for any deformity. You're going to look for swelling. You're going to do your neurovascular exam. Let's say you've done all of that. Now you said, um, you know, the ED said, oh, the, the imaging just came back and they put this picture up on and the resident asks you to describe what you see. Um, what are we... What are we going to describe? First of all, what's the first thing that we talk about when we're describing any imaging? The view. The view. Okay. So what are we looking at here? Okay. An AP, right? The forearm. Okay. Uh, so you're going to look at, you're going to say first, this is an AP view. And then you're going to say what body part or extremity or anything that you're looking at, right? So what are we looking at here? Right, the left forearm, right? So there's an AP view of a, the left forearm. And then now that we're talking about peds, what do we see before we even talk about the fracture? The skeleton material. Exactly. Why? What do you see there? See the growth plates. You see the growth plates, right? You see an open physis. And just in case uh, anybody can't see what we're referring to, so you see this line here, and then you see this line here. Oops, ignore that. So those that's where my physis is. And that that's, you know, again, first thing you do is that you're gonna describe your patient, you're gonna describe your view. And that also gives you, by the way, you know, if this is the first time you see an image, it's gonna give you a chance to kind of assess it and come up with your answer as you're describing the view, right? So I'm looking at it. You guys are doing great so far. This is an AP view of the left forearm of a skeletally immature individual right? Now that I've said all that, now I could begin describing my fracture. So what do I see? You could start off with the anatomy, just describing, you know, the fracture. Where, where's my fracture? Okay, right. So we're, we're talking about a fracture that's going through the radius and the ulna, right? So that's a good place to start, right? If you've now described the view, you've described the anatomy, you've described that it's, you know, a pediatric patient, and you've said where your fracture is. That's the basic, you know, anatomy of your answer when someone asks you to describe imaging. Some of the other things about, you know, displacement um, and all of that, we're, we're going to, let's leave it out of today's talk, just because this is your first time seeing all of this. So I know that stuff could be a little confusing, but if you guys want we we could do another talk and you know talk about angulation rotation displacement the types of fractures things like that but here's just kind of relate anatomy to fracture and then just take take you through some common examples but I, i'm glad you brought that up that that's very like on point um so then you know that's what you're gonna tell um you're attending obviously now if you're the resident they're gonna ask you some more questions so like you said, just to describe what someone might say at a, you know, a higher level. So I'm going to say this is an AP radiograph, the left forearm 
the skeletally immature individual showing a both bone forearm fracture with ulnar apex angulation. Um, that just means that um, the fracture, the apex of the fracture is angulated uh, ulnarly to, or towards the ulna. And uh, you could see that there's approximately one half shaft width of the radial displacement. So there's displacement um, approximately, how, you see how this, can you guys see this? Yes, yeah, so you see how this piece is supposed to be over here, right? I'm gonna say it's displaced, right? Because it's moved over and it's approximately one half of the width of the shaft, okay? So again, this is when you're calling your attending, they don't have the imaging in front of them. You wanna be able to describe things so that they could visualize in their head you know, what's going on, okay? Um, and again, you would do the same thing with the ulnar fragment, but again, a little bit more complex. So we'll leave that for another day. Um, one common thing uh, that about pediatric both bone fractures are uh, they most commonly occur at the distal metaphysis. Um, who knows what the metaphysis is? Kind of in the picture, so. Okay, so the metaph so the physis is what your the, the physis the the growth plate right so your growth plate over here that's your physis your epiphysis is going to be the part distal to it right metaphysis is the part that's kind of the widening of the shaft as it approaches your physis mm -hmm. everyone understand that so uh, a pediatric both bone fracture will most commonly occur at the distal metaphysis, as you can see here, or that widening portion where your shaft extends towards your growth plate, okay? So that's a pediatric both bone fracture. Next, we'll talk about a uh, type of fracture that you know you could see again in uh, pediatric patients, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about why, uh, but this is called a green stick fracture, okay? So let's start off first, by just again going through that same anatomy of describing um the imaging that we're looking at so who wants to tackle it and, and what we could take it piece by piece and work work kind of work through it together so go for it yeah so before we do all that what do we okay okay of what body part? What are we looking at? So the forearm, right? So AP lateral view of a forearm. And then what do we talk about? What's this? Yeah, but, but what do we see here? This is what? Yes, physis. So, so of a skeletally immature individual. And now, now we could get into exactly what you were talking about. Mid radial and ulnar fracture that doesn't bend so like it's a compound fracture. Exactly. Okay, so it's a green stick fracture because we see the fracture only going through one cortex. Can you guys see that? So here we clearly see there's a break in the cortex, and clear we also see a break in the cortex, right? Those are kind of where the black arrows are pointing. But then when you look at the white arrows, what do you see? An intact, an intact cortex, right? So that's the definition of a green stick fracture is that when your fracture is only going through one cortex, but not extending all the way through to the other cortex, okay? Um, this is more common in pediatric patients. Why? Think about it. What? Well, do you guys understand why it's called a green stick fracture? Yeah, it's like one of those. Yeah. Well, okay. So, um, yes, uh, you could look at it that way, right? Or, um, you guys ever pick up a tree branch and then you kind of like break it, but then one part is still intact and you kind of because it's what when you're when you're touching that kind of like wood, what does it feel like? It's softer, right? It's more malleable, right? So pediatric patients, um, their bones are, are still growing. They're not fully formed yet. Um, so 
but as they're growing, they're they're not, you know, hardened and versus, you know, a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old, right? So their bones are a little bit more susceptible to being, you know, manipulated and um they they tend to be more malleable, right? So they they are more prone because of that to incomplete injuries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions about a green stick fraction? No, so the, the anatomy of the bone is still the same, but it, it's over time, uh, as you grow, you're going to tend to have more layering of, you know, calcium and phosphate and, and the bone becomes more hardened over time, especially when you reach skeletal maturity. Prior to that, um, and we'll talk about bone healing a little bit, is that certain in pediatric patients actually even with the craziest fractures that you'll see, you'll come back in, you know, a couple months, two, three months, and the patient's arm will look like as nothing's ever happened because mm -hmm. they're they're growing. And because of that, their bones heal at a remarkable rate compared to adults. Um, so that's that's kind of why you see there, there's continuous growth within the bone and, and it hasn't fully formed to what it's going to look like yet. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Questions so far? No. Okay, cool. So um, the next two types of fractures, this is kind of like a little uh, mnemonic uh, or something to kind of help you, um, but they're both types of uh, forearm fractures. One's the Montasia and the other one's the Galeazzi fracture, okay? Um, so a Montasia fracture is, uh, I guess if you remember the letters MU versus GR, um, a Montasia fracture is a fracture of the ulna with the displacement of the radial head proximally. That's kind of why I pointed out that radial head earlier on uh, to you guys. Versus a Galeazzi fracture is a fracture of the radius with dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint, or the DRUJ. If you ever hear in fracture conference DRUJ, that's referring to the distal radial ulnar joint, okay? Um, so both are, Mitch, you know, uh, fractures within the forearm tend to be Mitcha fractures. Uh, one is a fracture of the ulna, and you have proximal dislocation of the radial head versus Galeazzi fracture. You have uh, a fracture of the radius uh, with dislocation of the DRUJ, okay? And this is just kind of like a little way for you guys to remember it, uh, if that helps you. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of look at some examples here. So again, um, let's try and describe this image in the, you know, just keeping it basic. What do we see? Well, the first thing that we talk about? It's a lateral view, okay. Before, okay, of the forearm. And then what do we see? Yeah. You can see it right there, right? You see your physis right there, okay? Now that we've described that, now we could either de describe, you know, the two components of what we see here, or we could group this together and say, you know, these are both components of the Montasia fracture, so we could just call it that. Mm -hmm. And if I say that to my attending on the phone, they're going to completely understand that what do I have? Then I have a proximal or some ulnar shaft fracture, and then I'm gonna also have dislocation of the radial head. Okay, or if if you know, let's say you're you forgot to say Montasia fracture, well you, well, you could completely describe it based off what you see is that you see uh, an ulnar shaft fracture, a little bit more proximal, and then you could see here obviously the radial head is completely dislocated uh, with its articulation here. Okay. Um, like directions, the fractures like like here they're both going upwards, but I don't know what happened. But like if the radio head is dislocated downwards, would you describe it differently then? Uh, it the Montasia fracture is just referring to overall the components. Then your attending might ask you, well, well, you know, how is it displaced, or you know, where is uh the fracture? Is it malaligned? Is it you know completely dislocated? Is it comminuted? So these are more descriptor terms of describing fractures. Um, that, you know, is a little bit outside the, the scope of this talk, but yes, you would. It, and obviously, uh, you want to give whoever you're reporting to the best, again, the, the way to the, think about this is that 
if you're the you know the senior resident at home or the, the attending at home and someone's calling you you want to be able to visualize exactly what's going on without you know having to pull up the imaging of course you're going to get a chance to look at it later but off the bat when they tell you oh this is what i have and this is you know what i'm going to do are you okay with that plan you want to be able to give you know you're okay is that because you've been you've gotten a, one a good description of the fracture and how it looks like on imaging and two, you've gotten a good description of the exam um, to make sure that there's no deficits or there's no any any urgent indications for, you know, operative treatment or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, you would want to describe that. Um, but again, for today, we'll, we'll just kind of keep it simple if that's OK with you guys. OK. Any questions about the Montasia fracture? So something a little bit different about this, um, obviously, because you have this location of the radial head, you're not only going to, the patient's not only going to be complaining of pain in the forearm, but they're going to be also complaining of pain and swelling also closer to the, um, closer to the elbow joint, because obviously that's where the radial head has dislocated, right? Um, and because of the dislocation, um, if the radial head is not uh, within its articulation, they might not be able to have full range of motion. Right. Um, so that's something that you might notice on your exam. Uh, this, again, tends to happen in younger patients. There's no way to fix that closed. Is there? Believe it or not, uh, you if you're able to get a good reduction, you possibly can. Uh, if there's ligamentous injury, um, that's another thing to assess. Uh, but most again, most pediatric patients you could see some of the craziest fracture, but they have tremendous bone healing potential. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that again in a little bit. Um, so Galeazzi fracture, again, uh, what are the two components? Okay, so what, what fracture do we have? A radial shaft fracture. And then uh, the dislocation is going to be at the DRUJ or the distal radial ulnar joint. Okay. So again, patients, because the dislocation is now distally at the DRUJ, um, and, and just if you guys aren't aware, the DRUJ is kind of where your radius and your ulna um, meet distally. And that's how you're, uh, they're, they're able to articulate, you know, with the carpal bones forward, uh, the radius is, and that, that, helps provide some of the, you know, the pronation, supination that allows you, you know, to turn and uh, your wrist at the, the uh, at the wrist. Sorry. Okay. So because you're able to turn, that's because you're able, you have that DRUJ, the bones are able to move around each other. Okay. So patient's now going to have pain and swelling at the forearm and the wrist. Uh, again, this is, could be one of two things. Uh, either a direct blow uh, or at somewhere in the forearm, or again, if they're going to be uh, falling on their hand, usually with the forearm and pronation, okay? Um, and you could identify this, right? If you're looking um, on an AP radiograph here, is that you're going to see widening of... Um, of the radial uh, of the radial ulnar joint on the AP. So right around here, this this should not be, you know, this wide. And then uh, on volar and dorsal uh, or on uh, AP radiographs, you could also see subluxation of the DROJ on the, sorry, the lateral. So here you could see it kind of out of place. These are supposed to overlap. And obviously you see the fracture of your radius or radial shaft and it, it's completely dislocated out here. Okay. Any questions? Awesome. So next thing you're going to do is, uh, again, we talked about the physical exam, you're going to check for range of motion, specifically, like we talked about, um, if you are suspecting a dislocation of any, um, you know, of either the DRUJ or the distal, uh, or the proximal radial head, um, you're going to check for sensations, you're going to check for pulse, you want to check their grip strength, possibly um, any signs of injury, deformity, bruising, swelling, et cetera. And then uh, you're going to compare this always to the uninjured arm. That's the rule of thumb. Initial treatment, um, pain control. Obviously, these patients are going to be coming in screaming. So you're going to want to, you know, remember that 
besides the fraction, besides all of this, and what we do is that there's a patient in front of you and they're in pain. Do you want to give them adequate pain control? Um, if they're a pediatric patient, sometimes to do your reduction, you're going to need sedation. So you talk to your ED colleagues about getting adequate sedation. Um, if the patient's, you know, younger and they're, they're going to be fidgeting and fighting you the whole time. Um, and then we'll, we'll just kind of talk about the principle of closed reduction is that, uh, you're going to manipulate, um, your fracture and recreate the deformity or the deforming forces so that you're able to realign the both parts of the fracture, um, and, and kind of have them meet if that makes sense. Okay. And there's all sorts of criteria for all the different fractures. Um, once you've done your closed reduction to see, okay, is this an adequate reduction that now I'm accepting that this patient is going to heal without me operating on them, right? Or do I need to A, redo my reduction? Or if it's completely not going to align, then I have to th start thinking about some of the surgical options, okay? But closed reduction is... is usually the initial treatment for most patients. And then uh, if they're a little bit older, you're going to give them a splint. This, again, is to stabilize the fracture, prevent it from moving, um, prevent um, any damage to the bone or muscles. For, because every time you, if you can imagine if you have pointy fracture, you know, something sharp with inside, and it's constantly moving all the time. If it's not stable, you could have damage to the surrounding structures, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then it also allows for some soft tissue swelling. So you don't want to make it like, you know, skin tight. You want to give them room to have some swelling. If they're a younger patient, like, you know, let's say a four or five, six year old splints, we don't normally do because we'll prefer casts in most pediatric patients just for the sake of, um, kids, as you guys all know, they don't sit still, especially if there's something bulky around their arm now that they've never seen before. And if they're in pain, they're going to play with it. They're going to rip at it. They're going to push it even and when their parents aren't looking. So things like that. So that's why we tend to do a cast um, for most pediatric patients to kind of prevent them from messing with it or tearing it right off. Because a splint um, it could easily come right off. Anyone could take notes. Um, who knows what we do to cast for pediatric patients to kind of give them a little bit more room in, in case they're swelling and so that's not super tight. Bivalve, okay? If you guys heard that term before? No, so that's when you're going to put on your cast, right? And then you're going to take a saw and then you're going to make one line along one side and another line on the other side and kind of spread it a little bit so that if, if this, you know, if this was... The, saw, the, the line that I made, I'm, now I'm going to leave there, uh, instead of, you know, kind of the cast looking like this before I cut it, I'm going to cut it and then spread it just a little bit and then wrap it with something else to give them a little bit more room in because, you know, fractures over time, they're going to swell before they get better. So I'm going to do that one on this side and then one on the other side, and that's called bivalve. Um, again, definitive treatment plans, uh, non-operative so we're gonna have them close reduce and immobilize them in a brace or a cast for some amount of time depending on the type of fracture and the injury um and then uh they'll come back and follow up in clinic if um if there's you know uh for some sort of reason i'm unable to get a good reduction or it's unacceptable and we're, i'll give you guys an example of that later on uh, then operative uh, fixation will come will be you know the next best step. Okay, uh, there's close reduction with uh, X fix or if you guys have ever seen kind of those circle structures or kind of you see pins sticking out of someone's arm with a rod stabilizing it. That's called external fixation because you're applying it from the outside um, without opening them. And that usually we do, let's say if there's like an adult with a really, really bad injury and they come in with severe swelling in the forearm uh, to operate while there's a lot of swelling is really difficult and there's going to be, you know, a lot of things in your way. So you're going to want to put an X fix early on, let it, you know, kind of some of that swelling to decrease. And then you could go back and do your definitive um, fixation, which is your ORIF or open reduction internal fixation, meaning you're opening the skin. Um, and then you're putting an internal stabilizer with, you know, plates and screws and things like that. Okay. And that's going to be, again, pretty common for both bone and forearm fractures. 
if you're unable to get a good reduction. Uh, some of the red flags that you could see uh, from either types of fixation is that, you know, if, if you operate, you could get an infection. Compartment syndrome is kind of what we talked about earlier. So if you could see here, um, this is kind of the normal anatomy of a forearm. You're taking, you're taking a cross section of it. Uh, you can see all the, the structures here are well defined. In compartment syndrome, uh, again, you're going to have a lot of soft tissue swelling and bleeding and things like that, that lead to a lot of pressure in one compartment. And uh, that's kind of an emergency because uh, that's someone that you're gonna have to take to the OR um, and kind of relieve some of that pressure before a more serious injury occurs. Some of uh, complications of um, either close reduction or uh, ORIF depending um, is sometimes you could have malunion uh, or non-union. Malunion refers to a fracture that has healed in a deformed position or if it's shortened or rotated around the limb. So uh, if you could look at this, it's obviously a cartoon image here, but you could see, you know, instead of a nice and straight bone, you could see kind of a little bit of a curve. Um, you could tell your, your bones are not supposed to curve like that. And because of its curving, and if, if I hold both, you know, limbs out, and if one's leaning a little bit, you know, 30 degrees or something like that, I might have a shortened limb. And and obviously that's not something that you want in, for your patient. Um, so that's what we refer to as malunion is that over time, the healing has occurred, but it's in a deformed position. Non-union um, is the result of, you know, a fracture uh, failing to heal or fuse completely. Um, this tends to to happen, you know, older patients, smokers, things like that, that have other comorbidities, or if you just don't get a really good reduction, you know, if you, if you don't approximate the edges of your uh, fracture and you don't get a good reduction, that could happen. But usually even then you'll see some callus formation and some healing might be deformed and you get malunion, but non-union typically occurs kind of in patients with other comorbidities or reasons for their bones not to heal. So these are some examples that were pulled from uh, fracture conferences that happen on Mondays. Um, so we'll just kind of go through these. So here uh, is a patient, is a 13-year-old male, status post mechanical fall. The top pictures are pictures of the injury, who wants to describe what they see. I know it's a little bit hard with the lighting in here, but, uh, and these are also like screenshots of screenshots, so it's, sorry, um, but try your best. Just kind of the same basic, you know, structure of what what we've been doing. AP and lateral. AP and lateral, okay. Of the, of what? The left forearm. Left forearm, okay. Yeah, so there's a little, it's really, really hard and subtle to see, but yeah, you could see a little bit of uh, a physis here. This is a dinner fork fracture. I remember. No, so that, I mean, it can, usually the dinner fork, you're referring to distal radius fracture, which this kind of is, but it's, it's more so uh, a shaft rather than approaching uh, the distal radius, but it, it could give you some of that same deformity, right? Um, and then again, you see it on the lateral, okay? And then this is what I wanted you guys to see. So uh, even after, you know, the resident did their reduction and they put their splint or their sugar tongue splint on, you could see that angulation that was here completely fixed, right? And then you see a little bit of if there was a degree of malrotation, again, you could see it well aligned here. You see the cortices are aligned perfectly. Um, so this is a good reduction. But reductions, we don't just look at them and say, okay, this looks good enough, so I'm going to leave it, right? How do we know that they're good? It's because the literature is, is out there for almost every type of fracture. For once you've done your reduction, what are the acceptable um, criteria? Okay, so one of those is uh, for both bone forearm fractures, this is actually pretty high yield. 
Um, if you're ever on a peds rotation, these will come up. The attending will always ask you after your reduction, well, how do you know this is good, right? Um, and this is what the literature has shown us. Depending on how old your patient is, whether they're less than 10 years old or older than 10 years old, or if they're approaching skeletal maturity, um, these tend to be older patients like over 10, excuse me, with uh, less than two years of growth remaining, right? So there's a, a couple of things that you look for. One is the angulation, two is malrotation, and three is bay bayonet appositioning, okay? So uh, I know those are pretty top terms, so I'll, I'll try to describe this visually for you guys. Angulation, um, let's say uh, this is, you know, one of the bones, right? Um, and you can see that this line is perfectly straight, right? So that's how I know it's, it's facing the way it's supposed to. But let's say uh, I get a fracture, you know, across. And here's my fracture, right? If the this line is still here, so I know it's in the right rotation. It's not, you know, backwards where the front is in the back or, or something like that or a little bit off but it's a little bit open like this, right? This is angulation, right? So uh, malrotation now is opposite in that sometimes you could have rotation, right? Of the two fracture components and that's malrotation, right? This is angulation where it's still in the same, you know, plane, but malrotations along the axial and you could see it turn here. Did everyone get the difference? Bayonet appositioning is when you have a fracture and the pieces of the fracture are kind of overlapping. So anytime you see an overlapping fracture, that, that's what this is referring to. Um, so there's criteria for all of these, right? Uh, and and we can kind of go through them here. Since this, was, this patient was over 10 years old, you want less than 10 degrees of angulation, less than 30 degrees of malrotation, and no bayonet appositioning at all. Um, and those, that's what's acceptable for a good reduction. Um, anything outside of this criteria would be either indication to retry a reduction, or if it's not reducing at all, and you've tried multiple times, then that, that's an operative indication, okay? Um, bayonet appositioning is only ever acceptable in patients less than, or that overlapping of the bones uh, is only ever acceptable if it's less than one centimeter short or what, one centimeter of overlap, right? Uh, and it's in a patient less than 10 years old. Otherwise it's never acceptable. Um, and the reason is because obviously the younger the patients are, the, the better they are at healing, okay? And how do we assess this? Um, quickly on angu for angulation, so your, or sorry, for your rotation, uh, you're going to be looking at the bicipital tuberosity and the radial styloid, and those should be a flat line, a 180-degree line. I know it's a little bit small here. Um, and then on the lateral, what you're looking for is that your ulnar styloid and your coracoid process are, again, 180 degrees. Anything outside of that, then you start to do. On your imaging software, you could actually measure the angle, and that's how you know. But again, way beyond your level, so don't worry. I just wanted to explain to you that sometimes when I first saw this, it's like, okay, well, great. I can memorize these numbers and I could spit them out. But like, how do I actually apply that? You have anatomical landmarks that that you're using to kind of measure your angles. And that's something that you'll learn down the line, okay? So quickly, uh, this is another example of a radial shaft fracture. It's a 20-year-old male who presents status post a gunshot wound, um, uh, and he was initially placed in a sugar tongue splint, uh, which you could see here on the bottom left within the splint, and then uh, uh, definitively they were taken for RIF. Um, so you could see here kind of two-plate combo um, and to get their fixation. Uh, to quickly describe this, just I know we're running out of time. So it was in, up here, we see what two views? AP lateral. Okay, and is this patient, do you see, anyone see a physis? Yeah, right, so they're skeletally mature. And uh, what fracture do we see? Yeah, yeah it's common muted. Or... Uh, comminuted for anyone who hasn't come across that term, it's when you see multiple little fragments 
uh, of the fracture. And you could kind of see part of this is from the, you know, the bullet itself from the metal fragments, but uh, you could also see some other uh, radio loosened pieces here. So it's pretty common. Okay. Questions. All right. So last couple of things. Uh, these are going to be just some quick practice questions just to learn about, you know, again, the, the fractures that we talked about, if we can remember their classifications and their names. So who wants to take the first question? All right. Five-year-old boy falls onto his outstretched hand. And what do we see? Green stick fracture. Why? Why is it a green stick? Uh, one, one cortex, not the other, right? So on this view, <laughs> it's it's a little hard to tell, but I think this is the ulna. I, I you would need to see a little bit more proximal, and I also don't know if this is like the left or right, but um, or actually it's possible. Actually, it's the radius. Yeah, it's the radius because if 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 you follow it down here, it's a little bit wider. And it's the one articulating with the carpus. Okay, so green stick fracture. Um, all right, next question. Who wants to read in, kind of go through it? Yeah, some reading graphs, but like the back of this. Okay. Um, is it Galeazzi? Is it more distal? Okay. Well, not because it's more distal, right? So we said Galeazzi versus Montasia fracture. What are the differences? Galeazzi had radial fracture. With right. So I see. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's my radial fracture. And what do I see here? Widening of the DRUJ, right? And and there's criteria for this that you guys will learn one day. But this is, this is severe widening. So I see disruption of the DRUJ. So again, that's how I know it's, uh, again, the two components, radial shaft fracture and then displacement of DRUJ, so galliancy fracture. What's a montasia fracture? Over fracture, radial. And proximal dislocation of the radial head. Okay, see, these are some of the references and thank you both for putting this together. Uh, it was a great little topic. Uh, that's kind of all we had for today, so. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, I think this is, you know, a good thing that you guys are starting early and kind of learning some of the language. When I was in your shoes, this was all uh, like, it's pretty much like learning a new language. And what I recommend is that as often as possible, even if you could just zoom in, going to fracture conferences and just kind of picking up on, on the, the language that they use um, and and kind of if you take one fracture per week or one fracture every time you go and just, you know, go, just ortho bullets and just kind of quickly read through it, it'll help give you a good enough foundation of learning what's out there. Obviously, you'll learn a lot more about this when you get to your third, your third year. If you guys are still interested, do your ortho rotation and then your sub eyes. But, um, you know, it's, it's good to start early. One thing that I recommend is the Handbook of Fractures. Uh, this is available online too. I, I just prefer physical book. I'm a little old school, uh, but it, it's a good thing to kind of go through um, whenever you see a fracture that you want to learn more about. Uh, they'll take you through all the anatomy, the complications, the treatment, the criteria, uh, what things to look for um, and, and everything. So it's, it's a pretty good summary of all different fractures. Anyone? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. welcome. I mean, you're stuff in another talk on angulation. Uh, the, right. So going through like how to describe the actual fracture pattern, we could we could do another one of those. Sure. Um, all right. We'll we'll figure that out maybe sometime over the summer or something. Or if you guys are away, we'll do it when you come back. So either or. Do you learn a lot of stuff like for the rotation, or is this like step two and two? This you will not see any of this on step two. So this is all stuff that, that you're gonna learn for orthopedics. Um, and don't be kind of uh, like disappointed if you learn this and it goes away and then you learn it again and it goes away. It's because you guys are learning a billion other things at the same time and 
orthopedics tends to not be a focus of the curriculum. Uh, but, you know, try to pick up what you can and there will be plenty of time to learn uh, when you get to your rotations later on. Um, and even honestly, a lot of what I knew during sub eyes is kind of faded by now, but hopefully uh, I get back to studying soon because intern years around the corner. So um, yeah, you'll, you'll constantly be learning throughout. Any questions from the people on Zoom? Oh, it's just <laughs> person, sorry. Uh, all right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.